Welcome to the USU Career Studio podcast that helps you navigate your career path. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to tell your friends and family all about it. Subscribe to our podcast on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you listen to get access to our newest content. Thanks for joining us for our Friday face-to-face episode. I'm Marissa Armisen, your host, and I am excited to welcome Stasia Dudley to the show. Welcome, Stasia. Hi, thanks for having me. Stasia is an analytical chemist at Syngenta Crop Production. Stasia earned her PhD in environmental toxicology from University of California, Riverside. Stasia has dedicated herself to a career in agriculture with a passion to help sustainably feed the world. Big shoes to fill there, Stasia. I, I am so excited to have it's, you on the show. It's a big problem. It's a lot of fun now. Yeah. Very interested to, to really dive into that today. But first, I have to uh, share a fun fact about you, which is you learned how to drive a tractor at age three. So tell me the story behind this. <laughs> I did. And I will preface that by saying I was in my dad's lap as I could not both reach the steering wheel and the pedals simultaneously. Uh, but I had the great benefit of at least being able to spend my summers and some of the fall on our family ranch um, out in Duchesne, Utah. So if you know where that is, kind of in the Heber yeah. City area. Awesome. Um, it's an old pioneer property, but yes. we love it. And, and he taught me how to, how to bale hay and all of that. So, okay. So this kind of leads me into my next question, which is really about this, this passion that you have for sustainable food. I'm really curious. It sounds like maybe your upbringing influenced your, your choice to go into agriculture. Absolutely. Yeah. I come from a long line of like, going back to the pioneer days of ranchers in the state of Utah. So I've always kind of grown up connected to food. And then, you know, I did a lot of hunting and gardening when I was younger. So just understanding that the environment provides food for us and it's up to us on how we best manage those resources uh, kind of drove my passion for this field. Super, and then super. Oh, go I ahead. love big problems. Um, I always have been a big problem solver. As I mentioned earlier there, I would be hard pressed to find or to think of a problem bigger than how we're going to feed. I think we're at aiming for 9 billion people in the next 20 years, and we've got to do it on less land using less water and tackle climate change at the same time. So, so I the big ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So interesting. Okay. So maybe before we dive in, I'm super curious to learn more about your work um, as a chemist, but I also would love to hear just a little bit of background. Um, how, you know, talk to us about your educational journey and, and how you ended up in this, this role. Yeah. So I would say my educational journey is a little all over the place. I've always been in science, but I've, I've hit five fields so far in my career. So I went to, um, I'm an Aggie by birth, but not by diploma. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Literally wouldn't be here without Utah State University. <laughs> my uh, parents met in school and then were professors there for like 20 years. But we moved when I was in high school to Florida. So I actually went to Florida State University where I uh, studied biology. I was going to be a biologist. That was like my goal. And then the BP oil spill happened. And I was researching in a lab at the time that was a marine biology lab. And that lab had to pivot to study all of the chemicals that were being dumped into the Gulf of Mexico. And I thought I just found it fascinating. I mean, as they moved more into that field, I found our interactions with the environment more interesting. And that led me kind of to think about environmental toxicology, which is where you can really see the intersection of biology, environmental science, chemistry, health coming together. And so I went to UCR, uh, did my PhD there. I worked in the agricultural industry, actually worked in pharmaceuticals in agriculture and how they can get into our wastewater and then into our plants. And then from there, I, I pivoted again and started at Corteva um, AgriScience, where I did environmental fate research, which is studying how chemicals break down in the environment. Uh, and then I recently did another pivot to more of a pure analytical chemistry side, uh, coming here to Syngenta. That's super interesting, Stasia. And I'd love to hear, I'm digging a little bit deeper here, you know, sometimes students right out of college, they think okay, I have this major, therefore I must go into X profession. Mm -hmm. Um, But I love that you just shared um, careers aren't typically that linear. We usually hop around to lots of different things, but I would love to hear from your perspective, what encouraged those pivots and maybe how did you, um, I don't know, how did you 
kind of prepare yourself to pivot. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I, I'll say I've always had very supportive parents who didn't do that whole, you know, you get the degree, you get the job kind of focus. So that was, that was incredibly helpful. Um, and they've been big on just follow your passion. So as my passions have shifted, I've just shifted careers and I've, I've tried to stay flexible by staying interested in as many things as I could. And being as good a student as I can be, I'll say that that's really helped having that backbone um, and then working as hard as I can. So I find it a lot easier to switch as my interests switch if I can say, well, I was pretty darn successful in this and I feel like I can be successful in this as well. And this is how my skills, they might not directly relate, but I can make it work. <laughs> I can get I that, love that. Box going. Yes. And I love that you mentioned interests, but I have to dig a little bit deeper here. So I have folks talk about passion often. Sometimes it's in a very positive light. Other times uh, there's maybe a little bit of uh, negativity around the concept, but I am really curious for you and, and looking back at your career thus far, you know, did the passion come first before the job or did the job come and the passion came or was it a mix of both? Where does passion fit in? I'll say I've had when I say passion, I mean pretty broad. I know I've known my whole life I've liked science, I like the problem solving aspect of that. And I've had this passion bent towards agriculture for a while. Now, where I fit that in has ebbed and flowed for sure. Um, anybody who's gotten a PhD can tell you that it's not all love and daisies and sunshine. <laughs> it can, it's mainly bashing your head against a wall for extended periods of time. Um, but through that, you can also find real moments of joy and happiness. Like when you're the first person in the world to see something and to get a result, I mean, that can bring out, that can really increase the interest and keep you going. So I was, I would say I've seen both sides of things. Um, Yeah. I love that. That that makes a lot of sense. And and I like that there was always the interest there. And then as you've Mm -hmm. taken taken on different opportunities, whether it be, you know, internships or work or whatever, you found that passion as you've been in the work, which is interesting. So I really like that. Very cool. Okay. I really want to dive into what the heck is an analytical chemist? Um, For a lot of students, I'm guessing this is going to be a really, um, an area of curiosity, maybe. Um, So talk to me like on a very basic level, what, what, what do you do? (laughs) Yeah, I will say that when I say I'm an analytical chemist, I mainly get eye glazing that happens um, along with some head nodding, like maybe they've seen that textbook somewhere. Right. Um, but like the, and the baseline definition is an analytical chemist that is somebody who uses, you know, scientific techniques to separate out an analyte of interest and then study it and, and quantify it, which is even more eye glazy than the title itself. <laughs> but in R&D organizations, especially, it's a really pivotal role. Um, for example, at Syngenta, we can't register any product to come on the market if we don't thoroughly study it in the environment, in any kind of food product that could show up in animal crop, you know, I mean, down to bee pollen, we have to study these chemicals. And you can't do that if you can't isolate them and then monitor them throughout all of their different phases they could be in. And so that's where we come in is that we develop the techniques to be able to do that. Super interesting. Okay. And I want to take that a step further because you kind of hinted at kind of this bigger picture that this work has large impact, but I'm curious in what ways, can you give me like an example or two of how your work translates into affecting like a large group of people? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, one of the things I love about my job is there's almost nothing it doesn't touch. So you as a consumer can go into the grocery store and be confident that the product you're picking up is safe to eat because we've provided methods to the government to track, to make sure that there is no pesticide residue that could be dangerous on it, that there is, that that is a safe product for you to consume. A farmer can apply, can read a label, just, you know, those basic labels that are sitting on, on, um, pesticides and say that it can you can safely apply that product without worrying about any negative health impacts to him or his family because we've tested it for occupational hazards and then as a company you know we can go to the EPA and say hey we need to register this product 
Um, and we know it's safe in the environment because we've tracked it in soil, in water, in, like I said, in, in pollen and crops. You know, it's not going to break down into anything dangerous. And so we can feel confident as well. And, and my job literally touches every aspect of that. Wow. So interesting. Yeah. This, this aspect of safety is huge. And, and I think that's a really, you know, oftentimes students come to me as a career coach and say, you know, I want to help people a very broad statement. And, and usually there's lots of exploration that needs to be done there, you know, but I love that what you're sharing is, you know, while the day-to-day work, you might not be literally, you know, helping somebody do a thing, but the outcome of your work leads to people being able to safely consume products, which is a huge way to impact your community. So I think, yeah, that's- and I think a lot of us will end up in jobs where you might not be on the front lines, but you can't, you know, as I think we've learned, especially in the last few years, even the frontline workers need a lot of help on the back lines if they're going to be effective. So where you fit in can, like you said, can be really broad in that way. Yeah, absolutely. I'm super curious. Okay, so maybe a student is listening to this conversation and they're going, this sounds super interesting. I want to learn more. Like what what recommendations in terms of, you know, getting some like job shadowing or internship? Like talk to me about how a student could explore this area more. So I would say almost all of these companies, um, you know, I'm at Syngenta now. Prior to that, I was at Corteva. Um, Bayer is another big one. And then there's the pharmaceutical side of things, which is a whole other industry, but almost all of them offer internships. So they're competitive. A lot of them are paid though. Um, but if you're really interested in it, I would, I would stock LinkedIn, stock their websites, find out when their internships are going to yes. be available and then, and then go for it. Cause it's, it's one thing to hear about a job and it's another thing to take a class related to it, but then to actually do it and see it as is probably key. And and I'll say a lot of people who go that route and do the internships end up getting jobs with those companies later. Yeah. Yeah. Really good insights. I love that. Okay. I'd love to hear more. And I don't know what privacy is maybe surrounding some of the work that you do, but I am curious, can you share any current or, or recent projects that you've worked on that you just found especially interesting? Yeah, I mean, I can talk about it in, in broad swaths of things. Um, we do have some of those privacy related, but eventually everything gets sent to the EPA. So it all becomes public <laughs> in the end. Um, but, but, you know, right, like right now I'm working on some projects where we're studying uh, one of our, our products in a whole slew of different matrices. I mean, honey and flour and, and different crops that they can be growing in. And so my job is to, to develop techniques, to be able to pull that product out of those different, like different compartments and then quantify it and study it. And so they're all very different. I mean, sugar is very honey (laughs) or honey is very sugary. Let's go with that one. (laughs) And so you have the problems of, 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 you know, throwing sugar into water and what happens there or uh, like the flour is also because working with a lot of water. So now you get a paste, right? If anybody's ever put flour into water, mm-hmm. now you're dealing with the paste you're working with. Um, so it's a lot of big problem solving. And then prior to that, I was studying how, you know, some of our products have been around for a hot minute. They've been on the market for a while. Some are what we call brand new out of discovery. So these are molecules that have never been seen by anybody else. And I've studied how they break down in, you know, in water and in soil or in with different microbes present and being the first person to actually get to study what happens to a brand new chemical in the world is always interesting. Oh my gosh. (laughs) And can be very unexpected. Sometimes you're like, well, the the textbooks say it should be this and nature is like, yeah, but we're not going to do that. But actually, no. (laughs) But actually we can do a lot crazier things than you think we can do. So that, that's that's a really interesting area of, of this is is that like discovery and exploration that I had not considered before. That's really interesting. Interesting, interesting. Okay. It's been really different because like when you're when I was getting my PhD, I was studying things that were all very well known. Right. I was I was doing pharmaceuticals and, and almost all of those had been on the market for 50 years. So there's a lot of research behind them. And so when you hit a problem, you can go to the literature, you can read about it. You can see how other people have tackled it. 
when you're in an R and D sector and some of these things are coming out of discovery, it is you. <laughs> you are the only source of information. Maybe you've got two colleagues who have worked on it who you can, you know, bat things around and lament over coffee with. But um, <laughs> but it, it it can be challenging. Interesting. Okay. So you've hinted at at some of the skills that you use on, on the job, whether it's communication with colleagues, um, the research process, but I am curious, you know, if you were talking to a student who's like thinking, okay, this sounds like kind of interesting work. What are some of those, those skills that you would recommend students really start honing in on right now? I mean, uh, there's a very technical skills that are just acquired over time. You know, any, any industry that's that has like in-depth field work like that, that you have to get it. You don't have to get a more advanced degree, but it's helpful. Um, But then there's, as you mentioned, the basic communication skills and sitting down with people and being able to hear their thoughts and ideas and maybe judgment. Maybe they don't like how you're conducting your research and listening with really broad ears because they're coming at things from a different perspective and different ideas and taking that in. And that's a skill set you can practice anywhere, anytime in life is to drop your walls and really just communicate with other people. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you talk about both the technical and maybe more interpersonal types of skills Mm -hmm. because both are very necessary. The soft skills will get you as far as the hard skills. That's for sure. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I'd love to zoom out a little bit with this next question and look a little bit bigger picture. I'm really curious, um, what has inspired you or is currently inspiring you about the work that you do? Uh, it's also the thing that frustrates me about the job, that I do, <laughs> yes. okay. which is the problems. I mean, it's a never ending puzzle um, in my job. And I, I love that. It's what gets me up in the morning and what keeps me up at night. So you get both sides of it. Um, But that's, to me, work would be boring if I went and I did the same thing every single day. Uh, In fact, one of my first jobs out of college, um, I worked for a state lab at Florida State, or not at Florida State, but for the state of Florida. And it was a, a great job. It was a secure job, but it was a government job and a lot of those can be fairly monotonous and I learned pretty quickly that that is just not the life for me so yeah Yeah. and that's a great insight that um sometimes we'll try things to find out that it's not the thing for us and that gives us better clarity of where we want to move into next so I think that's a great insight (laughs) okay always said never be afraid to to stop doing something if you realize it's not not your passion plan. So yes, passion plan. I haven't heard that before, but I like that a lot. (laughs) Okay. Well, I can't believe we're almost at time here, but I do want to ask you one final question. Um, As you look back, maybe at all of the, you know, cool jobs that you've had, all of the education you've received. um, I want you to think about 18 year old Stasia for a minute and and share maybe what advice, especially around careers, would you give yourself maybe at age 18? At age 18, I would probably say to tell myself to take things less seriously. Mm-hmm. I was a very, I was very determined and I was on a path that I was going to get my you know, undergrad degree and then my PhD. And then I was going to become a professor. Actually, that was my, I mean, both my parents were professors. So I was headstrong going into academia. And then I realized in multiple steps along the way, I mean, I ended up taking a gap year. I worked for the state of Florida, as I mentioned, then I decided I actually did want my PhD, but I didn't want it in the field. I thought I did. Then I interviewed for a job in industry and realized the research that is done in industry is actually fascinating. Um, so I, I, I would give myself more of a break that it doesn't have to be all or nothing all the time. Great advice, Stasia. Yes. And again, as I talk to students, I think all students could benefit from that. Just taking the step back and giving yourself, I think what I hear you say is, is giving yourself the space to explore without those limitations. Um, 
And, and like you said, as you try things, you'll learn, you'll learn if that's something of interest to you that you want to follow further, or you'll learn that actually we, we got to do a little rerouting and, and both yeah. are good. Both are great insights. So I love, love, love that advice. Yeah. I would say, you know, it's permission to pivot that you have to give yourself. I went to school. I have a lot of friends that, that were in that very tunneled mindset. As I mentioned, I was one of them that this is, you take these courses, you do this, you do this, you check this box, then you get this degree, then you get this salary. And, and life's just not that way. (laughs) You can wind up having a great career, you know, fantastic job benefits, all of that, and end up somewhere totally different than where you started. And that is fine. Yes. Yes. 100%. I can't say it loud enough. Yes. (laughs) Uh, well, Stasia, it's been so great to chat with you today. I so appreciate you taking the time to give back to your fellow Aggies um, to share some advice. And and you might be getting some uh, outreach from students with lots of questions. I don't know. So prepare yourself oh, now. No, I'm always available. <laughs> so I'm pretty easy to find on social media or any of that or LinkedIn. Um, so yeah, if anybody wants to hit me up, please feel free. Thanks so much, Stasia. We hope you loved this episode of the USU Career Studio podcast. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe and share this episode with your friends and family. 